Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Monarchs of Camelot by Rhapsody Games. This is a 2-4 player board game for ages 14 and up, and it takes roughly 60 to 120 minutes to play, basically an hour to two hours. And in the game Monarchs of Camelot, you are playing a story-driven card placement game. You'll be utilizing tokens to place down on spaces for actions to complete portions of the story, to complete persons that per per portions of your own personal story, Story and to change your character from one side to the other. Am I going to be Sir Lancelot, the Warden of the Kingdom, or am I going to be Sir Lancelot, the Vindicator? And that's going to be up to me. Each of the different players' classes, aka characters in the game, will have their own unique storylines. They'll work with the main story and they can change their character based on the choices they make in the game. Speaking of choices they make in the game, the scenarios will have their own choices as well that you'll be able to select or vote on as you progress. And everybody's tracking their, their HP, their laughter, and of course their victory points. The game will end when somebody hits the coveted 10 victory points, or there are no cards left to be played on any player's side. When no card Cards hit, we'll check to see who has the most victory points, and then of course, laughter is the tiebreaker. Talk about how to set the game up, how to play, and of course, my review. The setups for Monarchs of Camelot is different for each individual player, but it's the same for the main game. And the main game has different story arcs, and I'll just set up the first one. Basically what I'll do is I'll take the main book, this is like the location book, and I'll look at the top scenario card, and it's going to be the Unexpected Summoning. I'll place that card in the scenario area, and I'll follow what it says. Eventually it's going to tell me to put certain characters in the speaker locations on their location areas. There's also going to be this bottom space here, which is where you're going to be doing perils, and you're going to have a secondary board for each player's stats. There are three main stats in the game. It's victory points, it is laughter, and it is your HP. Victory points dictates whether you win the game or not. When somebody hits 10, that's the end. Laughter is going to dictate the player's turn order throughout the game. And HP is how many cards players are gonna start with in their hand. And for most, if not all characters, you will start with three, but you'll have different HP. As far as individual players go, uh, you are going to assign each person a character. And I here have Lancelot, the beloved knight. I'm also gonna get his deck of cards. I'm going to get his character card that changes when you place certain cards on the left or right hand side of him. And I'm going to draw three cards from his deck. I'm also going to get my own personal scenarios or personal stories. There are two different storylines I can partake in, the conspiracy or the investigation. I'll separate these and I'll be able to choose in the game which way I want to go and eventually I'll choose one of them. Um, each of these different scenarios, and for every single character in the game, is going to present you with unique options. Like, I could be attempting to complete the, this conspiracy, removing tokens off of these cards, flipping over, uh, or eventually completing it and getting points, or I can go to these stages of investigation to where I finally um, find the Fomori Balor and I have to fight this boss here. And this one involves me placing tokens on the cards, going from stage one to two to finally three, earning victory points for the one I choose to do. And uh, after that, you'll set aside the extra deck of scenario cards. You're going to have your own pool of resources. You're going to have a group pool of resources. You're also going to have your own little banner, which is your character that you can use as kind of like a wild. And uh, any other scenario portions you might need, as well as a separate general supply just for you. It's called your personal pool. Each player is going to have their own personal pool. They're going to use the general supply, and they're going to have their own resources that start with them in the game, as well as their cards and the deck of cards, as well as a starting hand. After you've gone ahead and assigned player order, so for me I've got the first player marker, then you're going to begin the game. Yep, it's that simple. Monarchs of Camelot is played in rounds, and a round will basically be each player taking their turn, and the main turn you'll be taking is your decision phase. The decision phase is pretty simple. You're going to have a number of cards to start with in the game, and you're going to select one, either one, any one that you want, and you will place it down to take the actions of that card. If you select the left-hand side of the card, you'll use the left-hand side of the card's abilities, and if you select the right-hand side, you'll use the right-hand side. Once you place the card here, that's when you're going to be able to, in, to partake in any of the actions in the game that you would like. And there's quite a lot of actions in the game. You can 
choose to do any of the three actions on the card from top to bottom. There is basically a popularity action where if you have the most of a certain stat, you can take that action. There are instant actions where it just tells you you can do this action without a cost. And then you have actions that have a cost. Basically they have a symbol adjacent to them and you have to spend that specific symbol on that card to gain the benefit. It might say to gain a spy, I have to spend a chalice. Or to get a magic and a crown, I have to spend a book. And for each of these location actions that you choose to utilize, you'll activate them. If you don't want to activate them, you don't have to. You can wait later. As long as there is nothing on that specific action, you can place one of your tokens on there. You're also going to have peril actions. The very bottom of the location board is going to present you with choices for each of the different characters that are in the game. You can take one of the tokens that represents that area or a thief icon, it's basically considered wild, and place it down on the board. If it's a thief icon, it actually will get discarded. The rest will remain there until they're moved or moved off of the board for one reason or another. And these are effects, actions that affect the players in a unique way, like frightened people for my specific character. It says I can spend a book and I will, Sir Lancelot will lose one happiness or will lose a chalice. And that will go for all the different characters that have all their own unique effects. There's also going to be scenario actions. Scenario actions are presented on the scenario cards themselves, and as you go throughout the scenario, it'll be like, place these guys out. And then these guys will have unique actions that you can utilize on the board, but only once per turn. And place those tokens on these guys to enact the ability that the character has. At the end of the scenario, or at the end of the, the round, whatever happens like based on the card, this is going to happen, and it progresses kind of like a choose your own adventure. I could also enact uh, with my specific, my specific scenarios that I have, my own personal ones. Uh, one might be basically removing tokens from the conspiracy and hopefully clearing them off or suffering damage penalties, or I can start placing my tokens on the investigation stage that will allow me to gain a benefit. Now, you have to have an action in order to do this thing. It might say you can do it once a round, you might utilize one of your actions from your cards, or you might use uh, an action from one of the scenario options here. So basically, if you can place it down, or if it tells you you can place it down, you do it. Um, there are three main actions in the game that you're going to be doing. One is to get, and I have my handy dandy cheat sheet here to remember the actions here, because they're kind of difficult as to how they function, not, not how they function, but the separation. The get is from your pool, your like personal pool, to, this is called your, pers your, your supply or your fief. You can take one of those tokens and put it in here. The next one is you can move. You can move an active token from anywhere on the game board to another action location. You just can't put it back into your personal pool. I don't know why you would. And you also can't put it in one of the peril actions because you can only do those once every round. And then there's place. From your pool, this guy here, here not your fee, from your pool to an, an area outside on the game board or on one of your character cards basically wherever you can take that action. And those are the three main ones. There's also a fight, which will allow you to damage your opponents by reducing their HP. In prison, where you'll take one of their characters, which are their larger symbols, in which case I have like knights and scholars and thieves, and put it on the dungeon. Um, and so on and so forth. There are a few like other light ones here in the game. Sometimes it will give you victory points or HP or a laughter. And after you have placed your card and taken all of your actions, you are going to pass. And it will pass to each player, allowing them to do the same. The next step is the outcome phase. That is where everybody, basically everybody has taken their turn. They've all finished their decision phase. And now they're going to come to the outcome. They'll, everybody will check their laughter or happiness and they will see how far they are along and change the order based on whoever was first, second, third, and fourth, depending on the number of players playing the game. Uh, from there, you're then going to go ahead and draw a card. You'll take a card from your deck and put it into your hand. You'll check to see your health to determine how many cards you can keep in your hand. And if you have at least the amount needed, uh, you can keep it. Otherwise, if you have one more or two more, you'll discard those cards. You can't use them. You can only have the number in your hand um, based on your hand limit. And then you're going to check to see any scenario updates. Are there any things that change in the game? And they all different. This one here says um, special rule. Once around, you may move a requested token from from their uh, move a requested token from their thief onto a speaker of your choice. So I can then say, okay, on my thief, I can do this and place it on a character to gain the benefit. So that's a scenario action. 
It also says that at the, at the round, end of the round, if a speaker has a number of tokens higher than the number of players, I must choose my path. Do we send the knights to the spy picks lands or do we visit the borders? And so if I'm playing with four players and if a number of tokens hits one of these speakers here, that will enact the next portion of the scenario. And you'll get to make choices. Sometimes the choices will involve a vote. And in those votes, players will get to choose and the uh, speakers or the speaker that you chose will also make their vote as well. And that will determine where you go into into the board here, onto the uh, into the scenario here. You'll, you'll choose a card, it'll say move to card four, move to card five, etc., which might involve you switching locations as well. Switching location, just flipping this booklet here to the scenario location that it tells you to go to. It might say to go to the Outlands, or it might say to go to the Village. It really just depends on what your choices that you make throughout the game. And because there are multiple different game modes you can play or start with in the story, it's always going to be ever-changing. And that's it. You'll check to see, does anybody have 10 victory points? Can anybody no longer draw cards that have cards to play? And if you specifically just can't because everybody else still can't, you'll actually get two tokens from your uh, pool into your fief. And then you will eventually run out of cards and that will end the game and you'll check victory points. And that's it. That's how the game what works. You take your turn, you place a card down left or right, and then you enact your actions, pass, the next player goes, and so on and so forth. Check to see the turn uh, situation with your laughter, and then check to see if you can draw a card, and then discard if you need to, based on your happiness. Did somebody win the game? No. Is the scenario continuing? Yes. Flip over the next card, or do what it says, and progress in that manner. And because there's so many unique differentiating paths and changes throughout the game, it's pretty much all I need to talk about. Additionally, the last little thing I want to cover is that when you place enough cards on one side of your character, that character is going, your character is going to change to one of the characters presented here. You'll actually place, if you place a number of cards on the right hand side, you might have Sir Lancelot the Vindicator, who will give you a specific bonus when you place him, and a bonus that whenever you place your banner on his specific banner uh, area. Your banner is a icon or a, basically like a, a tool that you can utilize to gain benefits, usually very strong ones. It's also considered a wild. But when it's on something, you have to find a way to remove it in order to place it on something again. It has to go back to your fief in order to place it on. So you can gain a benefit from just changing your character, also selecting which of the scenarios you want to do, and utilizing your banner as well as playing cards. Anyway, that's how you play the game. Let's talk about it. So I love games with diverging paths. I love storyline changes, being able to make a choice for a specific scenario to encounter something new or different. I also like the fact that this game specifically allows everybody to make that choice for which of the different locations to go to or speakers you might meet along the way, whether or not we're gonna start war with the picks or, or not, and maybe we'll try and find a way for peace. And also the different types of characters prevent unique benefits or bonuses that we can gain. And if we go too hard on one, one side, that might end up making us make a different storyline decision. Also being able to have our own little personal storylines where I can choose to do one or the other, and also allowing me to make choices as for the cards in my hand to place on either the left-hand side or right-hand side of my character. And based on those decisions, it changes who my character is and his personality. And that each character has their own unique different types of like strategy for how to complete their little personalized objectives. No character has the same objectives or the same cards or the same strategy to win. And each of the different scenarios presents its unique, unique benefits and challenges to kind of help you aid in your quest for whatever it is. Are you looking for the grail? Are you looking to defeat the big boss at the end of the investigation, the Fomori baller? Or are you gonna try and figure out the conspiracy and change your character in that unique way? There's a personal pool of magic that you can use and chalices that benefit you in certain ways. Some of your scenarios will harm you or hinder you as you try and progress through them. And you can gain victory points either from cards in your deck, completing your own scenarios, completing the main storyline scenario, making the right choices, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of luck in this game. This really basically comes down to the cards you choose to play and the way you choose to move and the choices that get made through the deck. However, there is some. Depends on the cards you have in your hand to start the game and what cards you draw, obviously. But otherwise, it's pretty much choosing the right decisions, playing the right cards at the right time, and utilizing your markers as best as you can. A few qualms. First thing is I have my personal so my personal area here, which is all my tokens I can just utilize for actions, it's called my fief. And then I have my personal pool. These are resources that are 
that's where resources go and they're discarded and I can get these and put them into my fief with the get action and I can also place them from here onto the place action. It can be a little confusing to remember those specific type of actions um, and then moving. You have to move your actions because a lot of your tokens will stay on the board until they're removed in some way, shape, or form. Like if the scenario changes and you have tokens on this board here, they're going to get removed. The cards will tell you. But if you have character tokens on the specific actions you've taken that have requirements, you place them on there and you have to move them from one area to another. The actions and the way they function are really cool, but it's just about remembering that aspect. Some of the characters' uh, unique scenarios could be better explained, like how Sir Lancelot gains his allies, because allies is a very important function of him. And I've only found a way to move them, which I assume is how we played with him, uh, is that when you move Sir Bors, that's when you gain him, and he'll give you a benefit that you can discard. And Sir Lancelot feels different than any other character. We played with all of the characters in this game, and they all have their unique, you know, unique type of objectives. The game is a longer one. It does definitely take probably two to probably three hours for your first gameplay as you learn all the rules and all the different actions, because while the game is simple and play a card, take your actions and pass, there's a lot of choice and a lot of combinations that you can make on your turn based on what you have available to you and the actions that you have available to you, how you choose to hinder other players, and the fact that you can kind of like bog down one player who's winning the game, um, or you can choose to kind of mix it up or specifically focus on one of the main three events in the game. The tracker works nice. There's a nice card here that illustrates what you start with in the game as each of the characters and where you place your tokens. Some of the scenarios are going to involve timed events. We'll use this little time marker that goes from the specific time marking uh, space and kind of goes down from round to round, making there kind of be this unique timer situation in some events based on how important or severe or quick the event must take place. There are lots of speakers. There are lots of characters that utilize those speaker spaces. They could be knights or nobles or unique characters that all function in the story in their own unique way. I really like this game. It's really cool. The artwork is excellent. The ability to choose your own path, not only in the scenario that you choose um, for your characters or the, the main scenario or just in the personality of the character you're utilizing. The only negative drawback is once you select one way for your character, you can't place cards on the opposite end, and I really wish you could. I feel like that would give me even more options. I feel like I get limited on options as the game progresses because now I can only place on one side of my character card. I know why it's done, I just wish I could do it nevertheless. Um, overall, this is an excellent little game. It's a really unique game that I've never played a game like it. I've played games with similar mechanics as far as there being an outstretching storyline and character manipulation, kind of like um, Call to Adventure by Brotherwise Games. It has that kind of feel in molding your character, but it's a dice roller. This is more a tableau slash resource control game with stat generation and unique storylines with a boatload and I mean a boatload of scenario cards. You will not get through even a third of these on your first game play, I promise. It's a fun game. If this is the game that sounds like it's something that you'd be interested in with your play group, you don't mind a little bit more of a heavier and advanced style storytelling game. It's not on the lighter end for sure because there's a lot of choices, but if you like that style of game, you're gonna enjoy this. Most of my table enjoy this game. There are a few people who are like, it's a little bit long or how the actions work is a kind of a little bit complicated. But overall, with gameplay, nobody left sour. Everybody enjoyed their time playing it and really enjoyed the customization of Monarchs of Camelot. Thank you for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Monarchs of Camelot. If you're interested, there's a link down below in the description where you can go ahead and pick up this game. You can also check out our live streams every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST where you can see us play games just like this one here. And of course, if you'd like, you can subscribe to the channel. Hit that subscribe button, the bell notification button. It's a good way to see more of our content. Pretty pretty please. I know I don't do it all the time, so hard to beg other people to do it, but it does definitely help us out. So if you'd like to, go ahead. Also, thank you so much for watching. And as always, I look forward to becoming the monarch of Camelot. Without you, you're going to be my subject next time.